So this evening will be different. Normally I would be teaching in the 1689 Baptist Confession. We left off at chapter 22 and we will pick up there next Wednesday uh, talking about the Sabbath day, something obviously very near and dear to my heart as a pastor being that Sunday is my favorite day of the week. Uh, so we look forward to that next Wednesday. But this evening, uh, we are joined uh, by uh, my brother pastor and friend, Rusty Reed. And the reason that you know is, is because uh, two Sundays ago, which is about 10 days ago now, um, so that evening, after they had had their largest attendance any time, I think, at least any time recently, so that sanctuary at max capacity could probably seat about 100, and I think y'all had about 120 there. So we literally had people standing for the service. And they had, you know, it's funny because you had a deacon, and I'll, I'll not share Derek Bozeman's name with everyone, but he came here and he, he uh, was looking around, wanting to look at blueprints because he said, we can't fit all the people in our building, we need to build a new building. And I was like, that's great. So we talked about it, you know, and kind of how this is built and like this and, you know, thinking something like that. And I was like, this is wonderful. And then the next, next Sunday, I mean, later that week, the church burnt, which, you know, is obviously the Lord's timing. I'm sure Derek had nothing to do with it. Um, but certainly, uh, you know, we, we uh, realized that God just said, you guys need to build a new building and I'm going to make you do it. Um, it is a tragedy, you guys losing your church. I mean, obviously, this is not what anyone... All jokes aside, this is not what anyone would choose. It's not a good thing, but I think the Lord's going to take this catastrophe and turn it into a blessing, and that's what we're seeking. Uh, but it's going to take his churches. It's going to take his people to do this. And so, Rusty, uh, I know that you have a, a message prepared. I do want to ask you to share with us just a little bit of uh, how the church came about, um, how long you've been pastor there, and kind of your, just a, a brief history of the congregation because God has used Brother Rusty to really um, lead this church effectively and well, and a bunch of believers to faith in Christ and discipling Christians there in Central. And before he comes, I do want to read something from 2 Corinthians chapter 8. So if you'll turn with me in the Word of God to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, I want to read verses 1 through 7. In this passage, the Apostle Paul is encouraging the Corinthians to give to what he calls the relief of the saints in verse 4, which probably is a reference to the um, starvation of so many Jews in the area surrounding Jerusalem in the 40s and 50s A.D. Um, under the reign of Emperor Claudius during the 40s and 50s um, in the first century, there was terrible starvation uh, especially of Jewish Christians in the area in and around Jerusalem. And some of the other churches had begun to take up offerings to help feed these Christians in Jerusalem who were starving. you got to realize Corinth is a few hundred miles across the sea over in what is today Greece, um, and they're helping their brothers across the way. It would be like if we were helping someone in Florida, right? You, you know, and... and, and for them, they would almost certainly go by boat. But anyways, I mean, these are it's, a, it's quite a distance. And without modern transportation, it makes it even more significant. But the early Christians from Antioch to Macedonia to Corinth, they were helping out these Christians because this church was being greatly persecuted and there was starvation taking place for the Christians, the church around Jerusalem. And Corinth happened to be one of the wealthiest churches at this time. And so they were obviously uh, able to help their brothers in Jerusalem. And Paul makes an appeal for them to do that. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. Now, Macedonia is the region northeast of Greece, modern-day Turkey, or really the intersection of those nations um, so he says that the churches of Macedonia, uh, churches uh, like Ephesus and Thessalonica and Colossae, they uh, had given quite generously. Verse 2, for in a severe test of affliction, 
Uh, this word affliction probably is a reference to all the persecution that they were experiencing. It's also true that the Christians in Macedonia were not wealthy like the Christians in Corinth would have been. I mean, they had some wealth, but Corinth was a far richer uh, city, and Paul talks about the wealth of the people in that church in First and Second Corinthians. So in a severe test of affliction, maybe referring to their poverty and or their persecution, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. So these churches that had the least and also were being terribly persecuted, they still wanted to give to help the starving Christians in Jerusalem. And so even out of their own extreme poverty... Paul calls it. They gave a wealth of generosity. Verse 3, for they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord. Paul says, I didn't make them do this. Paul is saying, honestly, they probably gave more than they were able to, but they loved their brothers and sisters in Jerusalem so much they wanted to help them. I just want to pause here and say something. Um, Local churches are not called to be in competition with one another. We're called to be in cooperation and fellowship with one another for the sake of the gospel and the expansion of the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, which means um, the churches in our area um, who hold to the same gospel and the same doctrines that we do, they are not our uh, somehow our competition. They are brothers and sisters in Christ. They are our family in Christ. And when one of our churches is struggling, we, we should help them. And I certainly believe that if our church had burned down, there would be other churches like Reformation who would be helping us. And so we want to do the same for them. So they begged earnestly for the, verse 4, favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. Notice they begged earnestly. Why did they have to beg? Well, they didn't have much to give. Paul wasn't asking them to give. But the Macedonian Christians wanted to help. They loved their brothers and sisters in Jerusalem so much that they begged for the favor or the grace of taking part in the relief of the saints. It's also interesting that Paul calls giving to the relief of the saints a grace, charis in Greek, grace. Um, We understand the grace of the gospel, but Paul considers it a grace, a free gift an undeserved blessing, in other words, that we would be able to help others, our brothers and sisters in Christ who are in need. And he says it's for the relief of the saints. Again, probably a reference to the starvation of the Christians in Jerusalem at this time. Uh, Second Corinthians was, would have been written in the mid-50s A.D., and this was the height of the uh, famine that was taking place in Jerusalem at that time. So they were feeding They're starving brothers and sisters in Christ. Verse 5, and this, that is this giving, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. Verse 6, accordingly we urge Titus that he, as he had started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. So they instructed Titus to go and collect an offering from the church in Corinth to help the Christians in Jerusalem. Verse 7, but as you excel in everything, in faith and speech and knowledge... In all earnestness and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. Church, do not miss verse 7. Paul tells the, the Christians in Corinth, as you excel in everything, that is, as you grow stronger and more mature in your Christian walk, you should excel in faith and speech. You should be more effective at sharing your faith and telling others about the Lord. As you become more, more mature as a Christian, you should increase in knowledge, certainly knowledge of the Word of God. And in all earnestness, you should have a greater and greater zeal for the Lord and to serve Him. And in our love for you, churches and Christians, we learn to love one another. That's part of the Christian walk is to love our brothers and sisters in Christ. See that you excel in this act of grace also. Paul says that giving is part of the Christian life. It is an essential part of the Christian faith. Giving to all of God's kingdom and missions 
in various different church endeavors, but also here in this context to help other churches and other Christians who need our help in such a time as this. So that's what we're endeavoring to do here at First Baptist Livingston. God has extraordinarily blessed us in many ways, including in financial resources. And our brothers in central Louisiana at Reformation Church are struggling because of this fire. A church that's been there since the 60s decides to catch on fire one evening. And that was certainly ordained by our sovereign God. And it is God's purpose that other churches in South Louisiana would come together to help our brothers and sisters in Christ. So with that, Rusty, please come and just share your heart uh, and speak to us from the Word. We've been hearing about you guys on Facebook and uh, talking to Brian and really excited about what the Lord is doing here and just not just excited, but also interested. You know, it's always interesting to see what God is doing. I, I'm very much uh, happy to be a friend of Brother Brian's, to have met him and to have built a friendship with this brother. I remember, this is how I first learned about Brian. So we have a mutual fr friend who's a pastor. His name is Larry Hubbard. And Larry, and maybe somebody else, but Larry for sure, uh, texted me and said, Hey, uh, have you heard of this, uh, this guy that uh, First Livingston is considering as pastor? I said, No, I haven't. He said, Here's a tape. Listen to this. And so I did. And I texted him back. I said, There's no way. There's no way First Living is considering that guy. And uh, sure, sure enough, you, you hired him. And um, good it's bad? not because it wasn't a good sermon. It was because it was my kind of sermon. And generally speaking, that is uh, an interesting thing for especially a First Baptist church uh, to do. And so we were very excited uh, with the prospect uh, of Brian coming here. And I know that he's just... So the Lord just used him, and the Lord is just doing a work here at this church. Exciting to see that um, anywhere that you see it. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit about uh, Reformation Church. Uh, first of all, it hasn't always been Reformation Church. It's only been Reformation Church uh, for a very short time. As a matter of fact, it was uh, Friendship Baptist Church. It was built in the 60s. So I, I'm from North Baton Rouge. Uh, always have been, uh, probably, sadly, always will be. But uh, I don't say that because I don't love Baton Rouge. It's just that uh, it would be nice to live somewhere cooler for a little while. I figure I've done about 56 years in the steam, but uh, the Lord has not seen fit to take me to the Georgia mountains yet or anything like that. But anyway, I'm from uh, Baton Rouge. I grew up there, graduated from Glen Oaks High in 1985, and I'm actually, I say I'm from uh, North Baton Rouge. Actually, where I'm from is a place called Brownsfield. How many of you have ever heard of Brownsfield? Okay, a few people know where Brownsfield is. So that's where I'm from. And all of my life, I've known about this little church on the corner of Blackwater and Comey Drive called Friendship Baptist Church. As a matter of fact, I knew all the people there. They all knew me. They were good friends with my grandparents. I know exactly who built that church. We called him Papa Prather. He was actually uh, a kind of a relative of mine. Um, and I've always known about the church. It was built in 1964, and uh, it's just always been there all of my life. And uh, I... Uh, Graduated from Louisiana College in 1989. I married my wife, and uh, through a series of uh, consequences and a series of circumstances, I, uh, I became uh, a manager at a brick company in Baton Rouge. I ran a brick company for 24 years, and uh, all was going well. My wife and I were attending Greenville Springs Baptist Church, and... and uh, uh, when the pastor there, who we were really good friends with, found out that I had graduated from Louisiana College, 
and a little bit about my background and religious education, he, he began to want me to do things at the church, and I did not want to do those things. I, I pushed back hard, but my wife was praying even harder the other way. So I became an associate pastor at Greenville Springs, and then I became an interim pastor at Brookstown Baptist Church. And then uh, Friendship Baptist Church needed a pastor, and so they eventually uh, called me or asked me if I would come. And it was, it was an interesting thing. There, there were nine people going to Friendship Baptist Church at that time, most of whom I knew and knew me since I was born. Um, and uh, they, <laughs> they had been without a pastor for a long time, and they really didn't even know how to call a pastor, you know, kind of in the Baptist traditional way. And so what they had done was they, they asked me to come and preach, and they asked another gentleman to come and preach too, a gentleman that I know very well. I, became his, I bought his house and became his neighbor, and we were really good friends. His name was Jimmy Gross. So Jimmy preached first, and then I preached next. And um, five Four people voted for Jimmy. We, we didn't even know that we were in competition. This was unbeknownst to us. Four people knew, voted for Jimmy, and five people voted for me. So I won the beauty contest. That's what I tell him. And uh, so that was it. Now, it's interesting because out of the nine people, five people voted for me. The other pe four people left the church. So on our first Sunday, there were four people there, me and my wife and my two kids. So we, the first Sunday there, we doubled the size of the church. And uh, then some other people came, and, and Philip and Christy came the next Sunday, and so we, we kind of grew from there. Um, but we'd been there, that was 2000. That was Easter Sunday, 2000 was my first sermon at, there as pastor, and I've been there for uh, ever since. Uh, and um, throughout that time, the Lord has seen fit to work and bless us, Casey and I. And, of course, we, there have been hard times, and there have been, uh, there have been great times as well. And, and as far as uh, people attending, we, we've, we've grown. We've, at, at times past, we probably grew up to 80, uh, 80 90 people at, at some point in time. But then um, we had a, uh, a fire in the back of the church. I don't know if you may have heard about this. So we've actually had, since I've been there, this might be, you know, some, cause some people to wonder, you know, what in the world I'm doing. Uh, but we had a fire. A, a young man uh, stole his dad's truck in the middle of the night. Uh, he was 16 years old. He took his dad's truck. His dad was a shift worker. His dad was asleep. He took his dad's truck. He, he ran down Blackwater Road jumped over this huge embankment and ditch onto our property, ran through a fenced-in playground. This was in the middle of the night, so nobody was there. Ran through the fenced-in playground and lodged the truck into one of the, we had a, a tea building in the back of the church, and uh, caught the whole thing on fire, burned the entire thing to the ground. And so that was in 2012, 2013, somewhere around there. And so um, the Lord helped, you know, helped us out and gave us the ability to rebuild. Uh, and actually, we put two T buildings in the back, uh, and we uh, we worked for about a year on that. the The Sunday after we had a dedication for those T buildings, and we had a, a kitchen shower um, for those T buildings. That next week, this was 2016 now, it started raining, and it rained, and it rained, and it rained more than I've ever seen it rain in, Brown, in that area in my whole life, and of course here as well. And I kept telling them, I've grown up here, uh, I can remember when I was a kid in 1982, I don't know if you any of you remember the flood of 1982, that was probably the worst flood up to this time. Uh, and uh, I remember going down Kumi Drive, and I remember water cr crossing the, 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 the front yard of the church. Little bitty, bitty water. And I told people, don't worry. It can't get any higher than this. If it got any higher than this, I believe I told my daughter, the entire city of Baton Rouge is going to go under. Well, it did get higher than that. And uh, it got about this high. 
uh, from, the, from the floor about midway up the windows, and it got about two inches in those brand new T buildings that we got. So that happened, and uh, again, the Lord was just gracious to us, helped us to recover from that. A lot of people helped us out there, and of course, a lot of people, uh, many churches were devastated, many homes, most, about 80%, maybe 90% of our families in our church were affected in that flood, including my mom and dad. So, uh, but something happened there after that flood. Uh, in 2018, about 60% of our church left uh, for various reasons. Some of them, uh, very good reasons, they, they, uh, they, they had flooded and uh, they bought new homes elsewhere. And some of them uh, bought homes in Livingston Parish. As a matter of fact, most of our people left to go to Livingston Parish somewhere around there. I don't know what it is about Livingston Parish. But... Uh, we uh, so we went through that. So we, I, we were just way down in attendance, and uh, I know we, we we were struggling financially mightily. And uh, then in 2020, of course, everybody knows what happened in 2020, and COVID hit. And I was expecting. I told the Lord, I said, "It doesn't matter. Uh, we're in it for the long haul, Lord. No matter what happens." And I was expecting the church to be decimated. So many churches that I knew were really adversely affected by that. But for some reason, just the opposite happened to our church. We began, a family came, and another family came, and another family came. And ever since 2020, we've been growing. And, um, and I began to pray, uh, not just for people. I began to pray for children. Because I love children. I got three grandsons, and I began to pray for children. And Sunday, the Sunday that uh, the fire started, we had 125 people there, and I can't tell you how many were children. I think on um, uh, at Wednesday, our Wednesday night service at last week at Foster Road Baptist Church, they graciously allowed us to meet there Wednesday night in their gym. And we had 30 children there. For a little bitty church like us, that's unbelievable. And people keep saying, well, I, you know, are you going to keep praying for children? I said, absolutely, absolutely. So we're just, the Lord has just blessed us mightily. But anyway, yes, last Sunday, we, uh, we had, the, the church was packed. I, I, I hesitate to say this because I don't want the fire marshal to to hear this very much, but we probably had way too many people in that little bitty 80 by 40 building. Um, and uh, that evening, uh, my wife and I sold our house in, in 2020 on Hubs Road and moved to the church. Uh, we were just going to stay at the church for a little while and then uh, in our camper and we were going to buy some property somewhere and uh, COVID hit and my mom and dad were there and, and Long story short, we hadn't moved yet. We're still in the camper right there and uh, couldn't be happier uh, there, than there. But anyway, somebody banged on our door, and I thought it was my son-in-law who had just left, and they were banging hard, and I was about to ask him what in the world he was doing, banging on my door so hard. I opened it up, and it was a lady who said, you got to get out now. The church is on fire. And we ran outside, and we looked. In the, we're standing in the front, and the church is just on fire, and uh, that is an awful feeling. Some of you may have experienced that. It's a helpless feeling to just be have to watch that and not be able to do anything. My first instinct was to grab a, a hose, uh, but immediately I realized that would be useless. And so we moved our cars out of the way and we watched it happen. Uh, and yet I have to tell you that as, as emotional as that moment was, for me and for Casey, um, it, it was different. It was different because we knew that no matter what happened, the Lord was a good, gracious God, and Christ is building his church. And so we knew that everything was going to somehow or another be okay and that God was going to do a work. I told our church that I believe that, that what is going on at our church is that God is moving. Just like I think he's moving here. I truly do. 
I believe that God is moving at our church. And uh, Brother Brian asked me to come and share with you a little bit, tell you who I am and tell you a little bit about our church and, and share maybe a little bit from the word. And so I wanted to do that. Actually, I had a, a bit of a sermon written and I'm not going to do it. Uh, it was good. You can get it sometime, some other time perhaps. Uh, but I would like to share some things with you. If you would take your Bibles, though, and let, let's turn to Matthew 16. Uh, now, let me just say this. Uh, I don't have... When I turn... Some of you can, some can relate to this. Brian can't relate to this yet, but he will. But when I turn 40, uh, I... I, I, I turned blind as a bat. I can't see anything. I, and my, my associate pastor brought me a big Bible, preaching Bible, with huge letters on it. And uh, I, keep, I kept it on. I never, it was just my preaching Bible. And uh, the preaching Bible went through the fire and survived. And I've got it, but I didn't bring it with me tonight. So I have to use my phone so I can increase the size of the letters. Even with glasses, I have to increase the size of the letters. So one day, maybe you'll, that'll happen to you as well. But anyway, um, yeah, let's, let's look at Matthew 16. Uh, look at verse 13. This is a famous verse. You're well familiar with Peter's confession at Caesarea Philippi. But let's, uh, I want to just point out a couple things. To you. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do men or who do people say that the Son of Man is, right? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter piped up, he jumped in. And he said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged his disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. Now, this is a groundbreaking moment in the ministry of the Lord Jesus. There's no doubt about this. This is a turning point. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's, it's very significant uh, when you study uh, the Gospels, uh, it's the revelation uh, to the, the, the disciples uh, that Jesus is the Messiah. And it was a great revelation. And Jesus was clear to Peter uh, that the revelation was supernatural, that Peter did not get it by mere deduction or reason. As a matter of fact, Peter really didn't even get it then. Uh, he kind of got it, and he kind of didn't get it, uh, because even after this, uh, Jesus tells his disciples that he's got, he has to go to the cross, and he has to die, and, and, and they refuse to hear it, and so they still have a long way to go, but this is a turning point. This is a moment that is a turning point in, that, in them, and there's lots to say about that, but that's not what I wanted to, to zero in on tonight. Uh, so when Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, that's what bar Jonah means, right? Because flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you, but the Father has revealed this to you. And I tell you, you are Peter, and upon this rock. This is a, this is a very clever word play by the Lord Jesus. A lot of controversy surrounds this text. You know, of course... Uh, our friends in Roman Catholicism have traditionally held that this is where Peter was inaugurated to be the head of the church, right? And so they say that what Jesus is saying here to Peter is, I'm going to build my church on you. I'm going to build my church on 
you. And of course, uh, we dispute that. We say, no, we don't believe that that's the case. We don't believe that Peter was the head of the church. Some people say, well, what Jesus was talking about is the revelation that Peter gave. And then some people also say, no, Peter is representative here of the whole church so that Jesus is saying, upon the church, I'm going to build, upon the, the, uh, the, the apostles, rather, who are the basis of the church, I'm going to build my church. I think it's a combination of two of those things. I think uh, Jesus says, you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock, what rock? The rock of that revelation, I'm going to build my church. But the point that I want to make here tonight is that Jesus is building his church. And what's interesting to me tonight is what he says after that. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now this is a, a controversial statement as well. Different people interpret this, this in different ways. The gates of hell is a, it's an Hebrew idiom. Uh, you can find it all through the Bible. It is generally a reference to hell, the afterlife. Okay, uh, But other people look at this and say, wait a second. The gates of hell, what do gates do? Gates don't go on the offensive. You don't find gates marching against other armies. Gates are not offensive. Gates are defensive. Gates keep people out. They don't keep people in. And so they say that what Jesus is talking about here is that uh, Jesus is going to build his church in such a way that even the gates of hell can't keep the church out. Okay. Now, again, I think there's some double truth here. Okay. Certainly, one of the things that Jesus is saying is, Peter, the Father has revealed this to you, and I'm going to give, build a church, and that church is going to have eternal life, and that church is going to be safe from hell in the afterlife. I think that's absolutely true. But I also think that there's something else going on here. Uh, I believe that when Jesus came to earth, the, the incarnation and the life of Jesus, that at that moment, God, of course, this is clear in the New Testament, God began to build a kingdom. Jesus, that's what John the Baptist said, right? Um, and th that's what Jesus said throughout all of his ministry, that the kingdom of God has, is here. The kingdom of God is here. So Jesus' presence was indicative and synonymous with the coming of the kingdom of God. And so when the kingdom came, Jesus began to build his kingdom where? Not in heaven, not somewhere on another planet. He began to build his kingdom right here on earth. And in a very real sense, that means that he was building his kingdom right next to the kingdom of Satan. You say, well, does Satan have a kingdom? Well, yeah, there's a very real sense in which Satan does have a kingdom. A kingdom that was abdicated to Satan by none other than our own first father, Adam. When Adam sinned, he in essence gave uh, the management of this world, which was rightfully his, God said, Adam, I'm, I've created you, and I want you to be the one who superintends this earth. But Adam abdicated that when he sinned. And he, in essence, gave that over to Satan. That's why the Bible says that Satan is the God, little g, of this world. Think about that. From the time of Adam to the time of Jesus, there is a sense, a very real sense, in which Satan was reigning over the kingdoms of this world. But when Jesus came, what Jesus began to do was undo that. He began to unravel that. He began to build his kingdom right next to Satan's kingdom. 
And I think there's a very real sense in which Jesus is saying to his disciples, listen, the kingdom that I'm building is going to be unstoppable. The gates of hell are not going to be able to stop it. And I believe that with 100%, friends. If it were not for that fact, I would be terrified about being in Christian ministry. I'd be terrified about leading a Christian church. Listen, when Pastor Brian talks about abolishing abortion, we're talking about the the gates of hell not being able to, to prevail against us. We're talking about marching right across the threshold of the kingdom of this world. Because the kingdom of this world loves murder. The kingdom of this world loves fornication, loves adultery, loves unbelief, loves blasphemy. But as Christians, we must not hesitate. We could have easily gone to another passage where Jesus said, all authority has been given to me on heaven and earth. Therefore, as you're going, going where? Into the world, the world that is currently dominated by Satan. That's what Jesus is talking to his disciples. He wasn't sending them into a Christianized world. He wasn't sending them into an evangelized world. He was sending them into a world that did not know the Lord, that did not worship God. And so he said, as you're going, make disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them everything that I have taught you. And don't ever forget, that's what the word low means. I am with you always. So this is, this is people look at us and say, what are you doing? You know, sometimes I look at me and say, what am I doing? I'm living in a camper besides a little bitty church in Baker, Louisiana. What are you doing going through the things that you go through? People stopped me and said, you know, people genuinely, and I very much appreciate it, saw, uh, saw me on TV being interviewed, and they said, you know, I really appreciate the attitude that you had uh, on the interview. Of course, my, my daughter was on the other channel on the interview, and she's got a face for television. I have a face for radio. And uh, she, she did a great job, too. But people asked me you know, or told me that they had an appreciation for the attitude that I showed, you know, this kind of upbeat attitude. And I said, it's not an attitude. Listen, don't think that I learned that from a self-help guru. guru. It, it's not that I went to uh, or bought a, 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 a self-help book. It's not that I am... Um, pushing positive, uh, po uh, you know, positive thinking or something like that. That's not, at, it's, it's not that at all. The reason that I am positive that God is doing a work and going to continue to do a work at Reformation Church and going to continue to do a work at so many of our churches is not because we have just determined to have a good attitude. It is because Jesus is building his church. Right here. Right in Louisiana. Right, if you, if you would allow me just to do a play on words, right next to the 2024 presidential election. Right next to the next legislative session as they debate whether or not to continue the wholesale slaughter of babies. Not so much anymore in abortion clinics, but by that little pill that people take. Jesus is building his kingdom right there. And he has said the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, I will admit that your pastor and myself... When it comes to eschatology, which means our views of the end time, we're not exactly on the same page. But it doesn't matter. We're on the same page on this. No matter what happens, Jesus is building his church. I, I guarantee you we both agree on that. 
Now, we don't know if he's gonna when he's going to finish it and what's going to be the case when he finishes, but that's really not the paramount thing. That's really not the most important thing. The most important thing, precious friends, is that it will happen. The kingdom of God has come. It happened 2,000 years ago. When the eternal word became flesh and lived among his own creation. And he lived a perfect life. He died a substitutionary death. And he rose again in victory. He was raised from the grave and ascended to his father and sent his Holy Spirit to dwell each and every one of his people. And even right now, he is reigning over his church. He's reigning over his church through the spirit that he has sent. As the spirit administers the word that he gave. And we've got elders, and pastors, teachers that are being used of God to take that word and to apply it. And most importantly, he is building his church one convert at a time. Right here in Louis Livingston, Louisiana, in Baker, Louisiana, and even in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, in Washington, D.C., Baltimore, Maryland, Detroit, Michigan, Seattle, Washington, Los Angeles, California. It doesn't matter. The gates of hell shall not prevail. Again, let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much. You are indeed a great God. Your ways are higher than our ways. Your wisdom outshines the most wise among us. You are good in all that you do. You are powerful and able to accomplish all of your holy will. And you have given us a great salvation through your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We're so thankful for it. I pray for this church. I pray that you continue through the word of the preaching of the word, the ministry of the preaching of the word, through evangelism, through all of the mighty things that are going on here in Livingston, Louisiana. I pray for Reformation Church, no matter where you would have us meet, how you would have us meet, that we would continue the ministry. And I pray for little ministries, big ministries all over Louisiana and all over the United States of America. Right now. Thank you for every single one of us, one of them. And I pray that you would help us to, to, to be steadfast, faithful, as we move forward on mission with Christ. Help us in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.